Hello, my name is Bob D. Hilster, and I am your particle model guru. And welcome. Today's video is uh, on the foundational problems of quantum mechanics. I have been reviewing uh, the five uh, problems of uh, physics uh, uh, in a book written by Lee Smola entitled The, the uh, Problems with Physics. And uh, I've made three videos already. Uh, a summary video here of the five problems of physics covered as in general. Then I made a video on problem number five, which was dark matter and dark energy. And the last one was problem number one, which was on quantum gravity. And yes, today's video is on problem number two, the foundational problems of quantum mechanics. This is what Lee Smolin says is needed to resolve this. It says, resolve the problems of the foundations of quantum mechanics, either by making sense of the theory or by inventing a new theory that does make sense. Now, Wikipedia defines quantum mechanics as a uh, field, field of study that started with the discovery that particles are discrete packets of energy with wave-like properties. Particles are not particles. Particles are discrete packets of energy. And, and this led to the branch of physics dealing with the atomic and subatomic systems. And it's called quantum mechanics. Now there's two general topics uh, that cover the problems that Lee Smolin was talking about. And one of them is infinities. And basically at the bottom here, he's using the guideline that sensible theories should have finite answers. And all of these three, including quantum mechanics, has some form of infinity that, that really should be corrected. In quantum mechanics, there's the claim that electric and magnetic fields have values at every point in space. Lee Smolin seems to think that uh, doesn't make sense. And <clears throat> in terms of infinity, how does the magnetic field extend out to infinity? Or how can it have infinitesimally small fields of force? in every point in space. Uh, seem to have forgotten gravity in this case. I guess that's because quantum mechanics doesn't clearly include gravity. Uh, there's a, uh, a, 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 a there's the Raleigh genes law which failed because black body radiation grew to infinity at higher frequency. It was the first attempt to try to uh, model the, uh, the measured uh, spectral energy coming out of a black body. And, and, and it did well at low frequencies, but at higher frequencies, the formula tended to infinity. And uh, that's a problem, and we'll talk about that later. General relativity has a problem with infinities because inside a black hole, the density of matter and the strength of the gravitational field become infinite. These infinities are problems and should be corrected. Probably the biggest problem in quantum mechanics is its reality. Uh, I recently read or saw in the internet that most of the uh, scientists working in quantum mechanics are searching themselves for some form of realism because they realize that some of the things that are going on are really quite bizarre. He says that reality should be true even when we're not there. 
In other words, sometimes when uh, we're there or when instruments are used, they affect the results and hence what we perceive as reality. <coughs> and uh, that's that needs to be fixed. Uh, <coughs> Some of the scientists who were involved with the quantum mechanics uh, evolution, Einstein, Schrodinger, and de Broglier, uh, they pursued more real realistic tasks. Uh, uh, although Einstein, uh, uh, he followed a path trying to unify general relativity with quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics seem to be giving such good results. But yet there were these bizarre uh, things going on. Wave particle duality of a photon and electron clearly seemed to show that particles are not particles and they're not waves. What are they? And hence they had the definition of a particle as a packet of discrete energy. And, and once, once you grab onto the wave-particle duality and try to run with it, you end up with things like entanglement and, and, uh, and uh, other, other such things. And uh, another one is with the Big Bang and, and, and multiple universes. Very strange. But some people in, embrace this. They, they pursued it, and that was Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg went forward with that. Well, Lee Smolin suggests there's three solutions to the quantum mechanic problem. Number one, the theory should make the instruments and observer a defined part of the system to be tested. Instead of leaving them out, if they're going to be there, include them. The second one is kind of the opposite way. Find a way to interpret the equations they do have so that the instruments and observers play no part in defining the reality. Two opposing views, but both of them tend to save quantum mechanics. It says, barring this, those solutions, you need to invent a new theory. <clears throat> now, the history of the quantum goes back quite a ways, although they didn't say that much about it or understood it that way. In 1814, Fraunhofer uh, measured the uh, solar uh, spectrum, the absorption of solar light. And Gustav Kirchhoff, he, he uh, measured the emission spectrum. And both of them found these spectral lines, which indicates there's chunks of things missing, like it, things are not continuous. But it was Max Planck that uh, did his work on black body radiation that finally explicitly stated that energy came in uh, uh, un unit packets. And five years after uh, uh, Planck did that, uh, Albert Einstein uh, released a paper on the photoelectric effect and kind of really started the ball rolling. Uh, took 20 years after Einstein before uh, quantum mechanics really took hold and kept going. This is a stamp that was is issued in 1987 with a uh, picture of the solar spectrum drawn by Fraunhofer. And you can see there's the spectral lines and of course thing, chunks of, of, of the spectrum are missing. Didn't call it quantum mechanics there, but there's the hint that things are not continuous. Uh, Kirchhoff used a local source that had a continuous spectrum but he shined it through a cloud of gas, and he also got these spectral lines and ends up with the same thing. Spectral lines show that things are not continuous. Well, black body radiation, if you haven't seen what it looks like, this came from a video I found. It's, not, uh, it's a very... Uh, simplistic but and crude experiment in terms of uh, measuring anything. 
but it, it, it looked like an aluminum box, sealed aluminum box with uh, three holes drilled in it. And then the uh, gentleman took a torch and blasted the thing with heat. And that's one of the requirements of black body radiation is that the black body gets very hot. It gets hot, but it doesn't melt. It doesn't combust. After you're done, the box is still intact. But you can see in the three holes, there's white light coming out of the black box. The box itself generally is not glowing, but the light coming out is black body radiation. Well, early on, it turns out that the, I mentioned the Raleigh Jeans Law, that the spectral radiance was predicted by classical physics to be proportional to the square of the frequency times the temperature. And over here you have the black line which shows that it, it starts out okay, not, not, not the best, but it's, at least it's uh, down there with the rest of them, but it, it goes to infinity. And this is the radiance, spectral radiance, and this is the wavelength. The smaller the wavelength and the higher the frequency, this approaches infinity, and, and that's a problem, especially when they actually got some good measurements. As you can see, depending on the temperature of their box, 3,000 Kelvin, 4,000 Kelvin, 5,000 Kelvin, the, energy, the spectral radiance increases, and I'll take the blue one all the way up to a peak, and then drops off. And, and the classical explanation didn't drop off. That, uh, that uh, drop off, the failure of this to recognize that be call, became the ultraviolet catastrophe because even though you might say it worked down here at infrared invisible light, clearly it wasn't going to match this fall off. And so when uh, in 1900, when Planck got involved, he empirically derived a formula. Empirical formulas are just a matter of observing the data, of fussing around with an equation, trying to find something to fit the curve. It's called curve fitting in general. Uh, for this spectrum, and he did this by assuming that the hypothetical electrically charged oscillator in the cavity of the black box that contained black body radiation could only change its energy in a minimal increment. The energy, the minimal increment was uh, E, and uh, it was proportional to frequency. He proposed that in, in the basic form of his equation is E equals HF. Uh, that's uh, E is proportional to frequency, and he stuck a, a constant of proportionality, which became Planck's constant. And it can be frequency or it can be the speed of light over the wavelength, either way. But he was saying that they. Uh, the energy was in discrete packets, and these packets could be represented by this equation, which included n, where n had values 1, 2, and 3. And he developed his formula, and he got this. And it didn't appear. You don't see n anywhere in this, and so what happened? It looks like maybe whatever he did, he used HF. HF appears here, it appears there, and, and actually what you can see here are two terms that compete against each other. As the frequency increases, this term gets bigger, and uh, this term also gets bigger, but not at the same rate, and so they mitigate against each other, and that's why, why the formula was able to match the curve. Still, N's not included. Well, I found this video and, and stopped it at this point where uh, using Planck's idea, uh, where the average energy per mode of oscillation 
was that that each packet of energy was uh, quantized by using one unit of HF and two units of HF and three units of HS, and this goes out to infinity. And the other term in the denominator uses the same thing, only the, the form of the equation is different. And when you add all these up, you get KT, as this author says. That, and when you add the new denominator up, you get uh, E to the uh, HF over KT minus 1. And, and, and so these are series, infinite series of infinite number of oscillators that he's talking about, and he gets this equation. It does include the one here, so it, it, it's, uh, it's ironic in, in one sense that it's the first term that dominates here in the final equation. So that's how it got. It, it is there in a way, but you don't see it in this final equation. It was 25 years after he did that, that he called his work a fortunate guess and, it, and at an interpolation formula, empirical formula where he tweaked it, where the quantum of action is a fictitious quantity, not real. He thought it wasn't real. It was just mathematics, nothing more than juggling. His quantized method is not based on a physical theory. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the experiment. What might be going on? Uh, this first part is to, going to describe the physics of the low frequency radiation, why it behaves the way it does when it's at thermal equilibrium. The picture I showed you of the blowtorch and the aluminum box that was not in equilibrium. The air around the box was not the same at temperature as the box, and yet you see the light coming out. But when you when you when you set this up such that the temperature of the air and the temperature of the box and the air inside is all the same temperature, you get a much more controlled response, and that's where these nice curves come from. So what happens in thermal equilibrium? Well, you you set this box in a room, a small room, or a larger box, and you heat the air, and you heat it, and you heat it until it gets to 3,000 or 4,000, 5,000 degrees Kelvin. And what happens as the air heats, the molecules in the air vibrate, and they hit the black box, and it causes the black box to uh, vibrate. Vibrating molecules in the box uh, can hit, interact with the air, hit them, and cause them to vibrate more or less. It isn't always more, but in general, it, it does increase because you're heating the air hotter and hotter, and this air becomes the primary source of the heat. And finally, you reach a stable temperature. When you reach stability, the interactions they continue to, the molecules continue to interact. It isn't static. It's dynamic. And these air molecules are vibrating very fast, and they're hitting the black box, and they're vibrating fast or slower. And, and these molecules in the black box do the same thing to the air. So it's constantly changing. When the air molecule hits the black box, the change in the vibration can either be slower or faster. So let's take a look at the curves. This is the black box. It's in, it's in equilibrium at some temperature. I'm going to assume 5,000. And what this peak represents is the number of oscillators in the black box are at 5,000 degrees C, and most of them are actually at 5,000, but clearly some are not. These are not. These are not. What happens is these interactions cause some of them to slow down or some of them to speed up. Some of them may slow down a lot or even more, with much like a cue ball hitting an object ball, a fast-moving cue ball hitting a stationary object ball, the cue ball will stop. 
And, and, and then what happens after, uh, in, in this case, if you were to stop a molecule from vibrating or get it to almost stop, the, the temperature of this air being maintained at a certain volume will, will slowly cause this, the one that stopped to move back up and, get, and go faster. What it means that is over a short interval of time, you will have these occurrences of smaller uh, vibrations, and hence you get the, this distribution. Most of them here, they get knocked down, they move back, they get knocked up, and they move back, and it's a dynamic situation. Molecules on the right side, to me, are explained by the interaction the constant interaction of the molecules with the air in the black box. Now let's talk a little bit about, to get to the high frequency, let's talk about the particle model for light. And particle model for light, if you have a, you have a peak here and a valley here, another peak, a valley peak, that's a model for light. Lots of G1s here, lots of G1s here. When you go to a higher frequency, shorter wavelength, these peaks get together. And when they get together so close, and obviously I deliberately jammed them right up against each other, you don't have light anymore. At, 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 when the wavelength gets smaller and smaller, you don't have light. Let me try to do this with my hands here. Let's assume the point of my fingers get it this way, are, are, the, are the peaks. If they're small like the point of my fingers, you can get close together and have them flowing that way, and it'll look like light. You get a larger peak, like my two fists. You have to be further apart to, in order to recognize light. So it's kind of a ratio between the size of this peak and the spacing that allows us to detect light. Too close, you won't see it. Okay, so this is one portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and I'm leading you to this point right here. Why don't we see radiation higher? If, the, if light is made out of the G1 particle, which is like the size of an electron, or the photon, if you want to... We, why can't we see the light here? Why can't the, the radiation? Maybe it's not quite so easy, but let's go to what we do measure and see, and that's the gamma ray. And what it says, if once the wavelength is the size of a nuclei, you can still have peaks of, 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 of particles clumped together and have that size of a nu of a uh, wavelength, and we get it. Something happens with the peaks and the the wavelength such that after that point, and it's not clear exactly why it exactly stops there, but one of the clues is obviously the size of the wavelength. It stops here. Black body radiation stops here. And what Max Planck was saying was that you have molecules in the black, I'm saying in the black box and, and molecules in the air that are vibrating higher and higher. But because the, of the size of these, maybe, maybe that's the reason. It isn't the, the, uh, the molecules themselves that are the peak. Uh, when they vibrate back and forth, they hit each other, release G1 particles, and, and they release them in clumps. How big the clumps are in this case, I don't know. But if they get as close as the distance of one molecule, it drops off. And none of these frequencies are noticed out of the black body. I'm suggesting that it has to do with the size and wavelength of the model, why it drops off. We can't detect it anymore. So then the question becomes, 
if those are the physical explanations at the, at the, the high frequency and the low frequency and the peaks, do we need the concept of the energy of quanta to understand black body radiation? Is Planck's mathematical juggling a basis for a theory of physics? Could classical physics explain black body radiation without the quantity of energy if they understood the physics of the black box? Or could we use the particle model theory of light to develop equations that could calculate the values of the black body radiation curves? Haven't done that yet. Lots of things I haven't done. And as I said before, lots more work to do. So the question is, do you really need the quantum of light? That's my foundational problem, is that we don't understand, if we don't understand the physics of the box, and maybe I don't have it right, but the closer we get to understanding it, the better we're able to model it and then get equations that are based on the physics rather than mathematical juggling. So science can explain, and it's my opinion, the ongoing interactions explains the low frequency. Uh, modules, mod, uh, the molecules cannot vibrate enough. Uh, uh, when they vibrate too fast, they, they, they can't generate the UV frequencies because the size of the, not the molecule, but size of the peaks of the uh, re re released light are not able to uh, be measured. By the way, they could, they could exist. There could be some higher than that. But if you can't visibly see it or measure it, we think it's not there. The, the peaks represent the vibration rate of the most of the black body molecules at that temperature. And the interactions push it too high or too low and, and the the uh, G uh, two forces that are holding the black body together, that gravitational force tries to bring these molecules back to a, uh, a nice stable state, and that stable state is the peak. My name is Bob DeHilster, and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the particle model. Thank you for your attention.